Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the program. This is Sunday Politics live on China's television. I'm Sean Kimbale in Abuja. Let's begin tonight by uh, what's the start story it was. A man in Nigeria has worked to the news of a viral video of terrorists responsible for the March on Air attack on a Kaduna bound train. There have been released yet another video of them whipping their victims and threatening to abduct President Muhammad Buhari, as well as the Kaduna state governor, Malam Nasi Arafai. At least eight people were killed, including a youth leader of the ruling APC, Amir Mahmoud, a medical doctor, Tibele Monzugu, Chenelo Mbegafu, and uh, the Secretary General of the Trade Union Congress, TUC, Barista Musa Lawa Uzigi. In the 11 minute video released by the insurgents, the male victims were separated from the women, after which they were flogged mercilessly with makeshift canes. Meanwhile, the presidency has reacted to that video that the security forces are not relenting and are acutely aware of their duties and responsibilities and what the nation expects of them. The statement went further to state, quote, the presidency in the meantime wishes to reassure the public that the president has done all and even more than what is expected of him as commander-in-chief by way of morale, material, and equipment support to the military and expects nothing short of good results in the immediate, end of quote. It's Sunday, but the last time we were on this show, uh, a lot of things have happened. Uh, it was a weekend of intense politicking where we saw a back and forth uh, between the main uh, opposition party and the ruling party, uh, especially between the candidates of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, and that of the uh, APC, uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu. It was um, something that was interesting. The APC candidate was reacting to the statement made by Tuku Abubakar and a right television interview and dispelling some of what was said, especially the issue of Tinubu wanting to be his running mate at some time and queried Tinubu's choice of a Muslim running mate and a same faith ticket. The APC candidate Bala Tinubu responded and has questioned the attention to facts and details by the PDP candidate saying some of what is said in the interview were not factual. As that back and forth was happening between Atiku Abubakar and Balati Nobu, there was some kind of politicking that was also going on, this time around in Oweri in the southeast, where Governor Hopu Sodima had gathered some APC stakeholders, and they were busy strategizing. They had a meeting with some APC stakeholders about the APC, the 2023 and how the party can strategize or strengthen its base in the region. Tonight, we begin a conversation, not from politics, but from policy and governance issue. Now, in some of the performance of the APC government and the expectations of Nigerians about what the Buhari government is up to and what they are doing, the Buhari government sometimes beat its chest of efforts in infrastructure development. There was a man tagged a super minister in the first term of President Buhari, considering some of the tasks and uh, the role that he was saddled with and the portfolios he carried. The work was daunting not perhaps reduced in the second term. And when it commenced, the minister was giving uh, the, minister, uh, the Ministry of Works and Housing to administer. The minister, Babatunde Raji Fashola, senior advocate of Nigeria, was a two-term governor of Lagos State and a senior advocate of Nigeria, perceived as one of the pillars of the Buhari administration. The Minister of Works and Housing is our guest tonight on the program, and he joins us live here in our Abuja studio. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Good evening. <laughs> Let's begin the conversation. I'd like uh, us to uh, dive straight because um, there's a lot to talk about. I mean, if we start with works, uh, we we'll probably need three hours to dig into every area. But let's touch on some of the most important and see how far we can go before we then talk about politics. First and foremost, can you tell Nigerians, Ms. Fashola, the projects that this government started, initiated, started, and has completed in the last seven and a half years? Well, we started uh, a couple of projects, and uh, we must just understand that we're dealing here with over um, a 
thousand different contracts. Each of our work is a basis of contracts. So we have over a thousand contracts. The moving target always. We have about 13,000 kilometers of road network under construction uh, across every state of Nigeria. We have housing projects in 34 states, about to start the 35th, and the FCT. And some of those projects have been completed. Um, many are in different stages of completion. In the last six months or so, you have covered, just as other uh, media houses have covered, ministers representing the president to hand over completed sections of roads from north to south, east to west of Nigeria. <clears throat> the most recent one are the roads in Ekitia, Fanlai, Iwaraja Road, the Isoko Ring Road in Delta, the Unguru, Gashua, Bayamari, the sections between Hunguru and Adeja, the section between uh, Geshua and Bayamari, uh, Lafia, Tunga Road, and different housing projects. Inside the universities and federal tertiary institutions like teaching hospitals, we've also been there completing, handing over roads. Some of the roads were not started by us, but they were roads for the Nigerian people, not for any particular government. And we have made haste with as many of them as we can finance, and we have finished them. Again, you must understand that the roads we're dealing with are very long roads, uh, some of them running into hundreds of kilometers. So they are worded in sections, maybe over three contractors, four contractors, which is standard global best practice to distribute wealth in the economy. So they are completed in sections and open to traffic. So there's a lot, and uh, even if I tried, uh, if I was a computer, I couldn't sit down here and, and recall yeah. everything from memory. So what we'll do mm. is we'll touch on some of the uh, visibly obvious one. Uh, obvious ones to Nigerians, uh, because not all Nigerians ply some of these roads, and but the ones that perhaps have grabbed the headlines. Let's talk about some of them. Um, although I asked a question um, about initiation, starting, and completion, uh, all this project that you're talking about is here. Can you give Nigerians some of these major, maybe five of them that you initiated, started, and have completed in seven and a half years? Well, at the moment, I, I can't off the top of my head recall what was initiated, what was completed. We're talking about 500, 300, 200, 150 kilometer roads. Who finishes them in two years or three years or five years? The process of even constructing a road, and I think it's important you ask, first starts with design. To design a road of about 100 kilometers might take you up to a year or more. Because today, the global benchmarks for road design financing is that you must do environmental impact study, you must do environmental, social, and impact assessment, you must plan to relocate people, otherwise you won't get finance for it. That takes time. Then you go to actual design, and then you go to budget. And budget is an annual cycle. So if, for example, now I am designing a road this year, the call circular for 2023 budget is already out. So if that road is not ready in design now, it can't go into 2023, it's going to go into 24. And I appeal to you to please check where in the world do you finish a 100-kilometer road in a year or two from design home, if you follow all of the approvals. So we need to stop making this pedestrian conversation who started it, who finished it. If governments did only what they finished, then we won't do anything. The real thing is to think ahead for this country. That's why you have a medium-term uh, development framework. It's not things that we want to finish tomorrow. We're planning for the country. That's how government works. So, yeah. 
But we need also to bring government to account on what, oh, on what they say they have done. And there are slow pace of work. Uh, I mean, where the uh, situation have arisen. But let's start with... Uh, okay, so let's go to one slow pace of work. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's begin with uh, the lagos Ibadan Expressway. Um, that's about 125 kilometers. Uh, 127. 127 kilometers of that road. Um, the question a lot of Nigerians who are not bothered about how long it will take is how many years we've been on this road. Um, when will this road be completed? That, has, I think, is the most important okay, thing the, to my Ni the, Nigerians who are watching right the, now. The expected completion date now will be in the last month of this year. We are hoping that we will be done before Christmas. And that is subject to a lot of variables. As we speak now, somewhere between uh, Ojo, the Oyo state government is constructing a drainage facility. So that has slowed down our work considerably, in spite of the fact that the contractor is now working at night. So just two days ago, Governor Mackinde and I were talking, because I called him a week ago, that, look, we need to make a choice. Which do you prioritize, the drainage or that road? And he said, look, the road is what affects, but we can't dismiss the need for the drainage. So he called me back to say, look, he has a solution now. He's worked with the contractors, he's talked to them, and we will discuss it in this new week. So these are some of the challenges. Then let me also say that... Uh, over the years, uh, at the time we took $12 billion to go and pay creditors in 2005, this road was bad. People used to sleep on it. So let us dimension that completion. The road is built in sections. That road has no less than 40,000 vehicles every day. That's the traffic road count that we did. So you can't close it down. So what we do is to close sections of one side, divert traffic to the other side, complete about 10, 20 kilometers, and then reopen it and move traffic back. Now, what you might not know, and it's important to share this, the construction material largely comes from Ogun State. So whether you are constructing the Lagos section or the Oyo section, you have to go and move laterite, cross stones, and all of that. They move in the same traffic. So thousands of daily truck trips and that road is being excavated to about a meter or more deep. So we're essentially first removing bad material, unsuitable material, filling up, and then constructing the road. So I don't think it is slow. What has happened is that over the years, government has not funded this sufficiently. It is this precedent that has gone abroad to say, some of the money that was stolen from Nigeria, please give it back to me. I want to use it to build a road in Nigeria. And on its integrity and reputation, some of those monies have been released. It is this precedent that has said, okay, the dividends from NLNG will be applied to this road. So these dividends were there before. Why didn't anybody think about them? And now, if you check, on the average, if you Google traffic time on that road now, even though we are not yet finished, it's, it's less than two hours now to go to Ibadro. You can do Ibadro and come back twice a day now. And we haven't finished. People used to do a one-way trip for a whole day. So that's progress. Mm. Now, so uh, the word is, in summary, the, we uh, plan Lagos to finish this year. In December, this year. Subject to some of these challenges that I've told you, because we don't want to finish, and then the road is opened again because you have to excavate. So we're waiting for your state to solve it. Governor Makede and I will resolve that pretty soon. Okay, so the expectation, December, possibly. Yeah. And if not, maybe January. And if you see, the lane marking is already going on. The road furniture is already mm. simultaneously being installed. So and the last six kilometers on the Julius Burgess side is already being done into Lagos. So what is left is about 15 kilometers on the RCC side into Ibado. Okay. So give or take, we have about 21 kilometers on both sides. Uh, Precisely. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, that will be told. That road will be told at some point after the after that e completion. Eventually, it will be told. It will be handed over to the concessionaires who NSI is talking to to bring in more financing. Have they won the bid already? No, 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 no. That's why I can't name a concession. Okay. NSI is a government agency working to stimulate investment to finance the road. Okay. At what point uh, did you, you design a tolling infrastructure? 
on that uh, 127 kilometers. At what point, how many of uh, uh, points do can we expect tolling Off on that road? Off the top of my head, and I, 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 I want to say this with a caveat, I think it's two, three toll plazas, I think so. As possible. On yeah, one on the Lagos end, one in the Ogun end, and I think in Ogiri, and the other one, which is in Ibadan, which is what we used to have there okay. before traditionally. Let's move uh, quickly also to, so Nigerians are keeping tabs on some of the things that you have said, uh, and expectations are that some of the things that you said will come to fusion uh, based on work that has been seen. Um, the second Niger Bridge, what is the extent of work, and what is the possible completion date? Okay, so let me answer the second question first, which is that we are planning also before Christmas to uh, open that to public for use because that's when there is a large movement of Christmas. You mean Lagos Ibadan? No, no, no. Second, second Niger, Niger Bridge. We are planning, okay. hopefully, Touchwood before, by Christmas, it should also be open. That was the last meeting I had with the contractor, I think, about three weeks ago. Uh, there are challenges, of course, as you, you might know, but the main bridge deck is finished. The toll plazas have been built. Now, the seven-kilometer road from the Obosi side linking the bridge to the uh, Anambra end is what is being worked on. The last time I went there, I think about five kilometers of it has already been paved. But we were waiting for the sand because it's built on reclaimed soil. So there's a process using prevaricated vertical drugs to accelerate the settlement of the reclaimed sand so that they can build. I haven't been there now. I think I went there in January or February. So, but I get reports and there's progress. Now we have to build a link road on the Asaba side, which is about four kilometers. So we just finished that design. This was the review we were doing about three weeks ago, and we are trying to sort out the issue of community claims for compensation and all of that. But this is a high tide season, so no meaningful work can go on now. Contractor remains confident that that four kilometer road can be completed before December. So Touchwood, bridge is finished. It's just the access road now to link it. So for those who are applying Lagos about an expressway, December is the fact that they can apply that road for... They are already using confident. it where we're no, building I mean, without anyway, no major we should be construction. Done. Yeah, we same, should be done. same with the second Niger bridge. We expect to be done. That's yeah. our plan. Now, um, for those who are also so worried about some major uh, 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 expressway, uh, the Songwater, Adeokuta Expressway. I like to know what is the thing because there, there are a lot of uh, disaster happening on that stretch of road. And another one is the Ibadan Ilorin Expressway. It's been on the car since 1979. That's about 43 years ago. And the question would be, I wasn't there what exactly this problem? Ago. Yeah, I got there. Uh, but I mean, six you and a half years ago. <laughs> you made so, reference to government coming so, and coming. So let's talk about question. Ibadan Ilorin. That is the road that leads you through your Obomosho to Ilorin. Now, and uh, you will recall that when this administration was elected, between Ilori and Jeba, a barely 100 kilometer stretch used to take four days. It's now 90 minutes. Yes, let me repeat it. Ilori and Jeba used to take four days. I went there. I saw people moving goods, perishables. They were either selling them or throwing them away. People were slaughtering their cattle because they were going to die. They were trapped in there for days, 100 kilometers. It now takes 90 minutes. We did that. Now, the continuation all the way down to, to Ibadan is the outer ring road, taking the road out of uh, Ubumo Short Town. It was awarded before we came, but it was never funded. Now, so we initiated the suku, And if you go there now, you will see that work is going on at pace. There were issues, community issues. There was also land. There was a part of the road that passed through an old Methodist church. And members of the church came to appeal that we should change the alignment because they do not want to lose that historic church. I acceded to that request. So that took time to redesign that section. So now that road is now benefiting from the NMPC tax credit scheme. That NMPC tax credit scheme, for your information, is coming from the PTDF, the Petroleum Development Trust Fund. 
If you go and Google PTDF, you will see the scandal that PTDF used to represent before this administration, sleaze and scandal. And Buhari has turned that around. PTDF now represents investment in infrastructure through the NMPC. So that road will be finished. We have a timeline for it. I can't remember that off the top of my head because there were 21 roads that we made all the contractors sign completion dates with, for that fund because the major problem in the past and even partly now is inadequate funds to do all of the things that Nigeria needs to build. And our road to greatness and prosperity is going to be built on the foundation of our prosperity. If I stay on roads alone, because uh, I, I monitor the, uh, the situation on the Abuja Kano Road, uh, the Sokoto Expressway, um, the um, Akure Adwekiti Express, I mean, road, these, are, th these roads are not in moderable condition. Which road? But the, the Abuja, uh, the Akure Adwekiti. Akure Adwekiti was not, there was no funding for it. That's why it's not in multiple conditions. So let's, let's talk about how democracy works. Yeah, but me. I mean, the question is that Shea, for let Nigerians, me make this, just, let, let me just, just a moment. The, 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 for Nigerians, mm. what they want is what their government would do for them. Yes, yes. So the so question listen. is that when they are raising some of these issues, oh, it's they are wondering issue that to raise there it. are let two, me respond there, to it. Okay, absolutely, go ahead, please. Let me respond to it. It's important to sit down and look at the budget. We don't pay enough attention to these things, okay? So let us take Lagos Ibadan Expressway. That road passes through three states. Each state has three senators. That's 12 senators. I mean, nine senators. Lagos has 24 reps. I think Oyo has 14. I think Ogun has nine. When did all those reps sit down to say, by hook, by crook, this is our priority, and we are going to budget for it? Until we put this, uh, this fund, the Presidential Infrastructure Fund and the NLNG, go and look at what was in those budgets, 10 billion, 5 billion. Which contractor mobilizes for a 200 or plus billion road or 5 billion? Do you know how much it, it takes to set up a construction yard? So go through the budget. That's what you will see. 200 million for a 10 billion road. So these are the issues. Unless there are special and dedicated interventions like this, like the Sukuk and all of that, even the Sukuk, when we started, it was 25 roads, mm. okay, with 100 billion. Now we're at 77 roads, right, with 210 billion. Are we getting better? Everybody insists. And the final decision about how much you can spend is with parliament, understandably so, the power of the purse. Right. So we now have 77 roads struggling for 210 billion. Averagely, if you average it out, 3 billion. What does that do on those roads that you are talking about? With 3 billion build a kitty to Undo Road, a Adu Kitty Road, it won't. So there are no hopes for those people who are asking No, we have put the, some support there so that the work can start. We are looking at talking to the African Development Bank. We have mm. to borrow. Yeah. If we borrow, some people will say, why are you borrowing? Yeah, but let, 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 let's talk about those who cook funds. And I mean, it's at the point in time when the nation is talking so about So the NMPC again, problem. through tax credit, has intervened. These are all initiatives trying to solve a big problem. These are things we left undone for decades. Okay. Um, let me ask you this, and from, I mean, first and foremost, before we go into the Sukuk bonds, and I'd like you to clarify a few issues. Now, um, this government will say infrastructure as being, uh, they've taken infrastructure as priority. But as a minister that has taken a huge chunk of that sector, can you beat your chest tonight and tell Nigerians that this government has done well and met expectations of Nigerians in that aspect? I can beat my chest and say that I have improved significantly on what we met. And the test of the pudding is simply in the eating. So on all of those roads where we are working, those we have completed, those we are still working on, go and ask the commuters what their experience was before we came. Go and ask them what their experience is today and what their expectation is against December and against next year. I can say that very, very confidently because I've had the support of my principal. He understands that the basis of building an economy is infrastructure. That's what translates to ease of doing business, efficiency, choice, productivity. 
And that is also the way to legitimately distribute wealth. So we are talking of infrastructure and roads. You are not seeing the bigger picture. Every time we issue a contract, banks are issuing advance payment guarantees, the charging commission. Engineers, consultants are employed on site to inspect, to sign reports. They don't do that for free. We pay them. People are supplying quarry. They're supplying asphalt. They're supplying diesel. They're supplying lubricants. Artisans are employed on site. Laboratories are involved to test quality. People are vending food, water on every construction site. Able young bodied men and women willing to work go to those sites. So you are moving, you are supplying millions of liters of diesel. It's not government that, that does the diesel supply. Mm. It's right. not the contractor. So that's an economic exchange, an ecosystem of opportunities. Uh, uh, right. So it's more than just a road or a bridge or a house. Is moving money around, creating wealth and opportunities. Yeah, I'll still come to the Sukuk. Uh, like I said, I need some clarification on that because okay. I understand there are about 10 Sukuk bonds that I've been taking under these. 10 uh, Sukuk bonds? Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> Your information is not correct. Okay, so we'll get to that in a moment and you clarify. That's why I said we need some clarification. But before we go into that, Honorable Minister, let's call it spade a spade. Is this nation broke? I don't manage the finances of the country. I know that there are financial headwinds globally, and all the nations, or almost all of them, are facing one economic challenge or the other. Access to funding is becoming challenging. There are so many reasons for that. Uh, there's a global lockdown that happened uh, during COVID, so economic activities slowed down. Uh, one of the biggest production centers in the world is still battling with COVID. And in a global economy today, uh, it's almost like a domino effect when there's a problem in one part of the world. But uh, to the extent that we are able to access credit, if you are not financially solvent and viable, uh, then you have a problem. To the extent that we are able to access credit, we are still reasonably able to fund some of our obligations, most of our obligations, I would say. There has been no notice of default issued by any of our creditors. And so we must also understand, and I make this distinction with, public finance is not home economics. The challenges and the variables are different. Uh, so because you're central to the economic uh, uh, factors and the vari uh, variations that, that has happened over the years. Uh, but Naira is on a free fall, and the projections are not looking good at all. Even the federal, I mean, the Minister of Finance have come out to say things, uh, our revenue is uh, troubled. Um, uh, because of the position that you hold in this cabinet and in this government, what can you tell Nigerians about the economy, which you play a central role, and how do you convince Nigerians that this government is doing the right thing? Well, you see, uh, one of my favorite sayings is that let us have a conversation with right thinking and well-meaning people. And I think it was a favorite saying of Chilechi for Bafemi Aulo too, because not everybody agrees with you, and not everybody also has the same view about what is right. But the important thing is that, for example, no ministry, no minister can tell you, and that has never happened, uh, no minister can tell you that he has all the resources to do all what it needs. Nigeria, like every nation, doesn't have all of the resources to do what, what we need to do in Nigeria. So we have to make choices. But given the challenges that we met, the challenges that we anticipated, the ones that we did not anticipate, I think as far as the fundamentals of the economy are concerned, right? The basic foundation for projecting growth are being laid. And yes, people feel pain, people feel discomfort, and this has always been the case. Whether I go back to the period of Udoji Arias, Udoji Award, there's a song that was sung, I think, shortly after I was born, before I was born, Ilule Kosowolo De, or It's always been like that. But a glorious dawn is on the horizon. This can't go on globally forever. And if you put all the fundamentals in place, where a one-hour journey doesn't take six hours, people will become more efficient. People will have choice. But in that process of rebuilding, there will be some pain. Maybe this is that pain 
that we are going through. But at the end of it, I see that with good infrastructure, we will be able to compete better. All the nations we want to be like are sitting on a, on a foundation of well-established infrastructure, rail, airports, uh, highways, choice, intracity rail, efficient broadband. And that is why, so our population has grown at a rate faster than we have provided infrastructure. And that is what this government is focused on. So it's not infrastructure for infrastructure. It's infrastructure for a better life. Mm. Well, yeah, man. You might be working on infrastructure, but the, the question is how much of, uh, how better has it made the lives of Nigerians? Because the question, the emphasis, uh, okay, so you're spoken, you're spoken uh, beautifully about the situation, but the situation is looking more gloomy than it is in reality. Because if you compare what the picture, gloom, the picture of gloom that you paint it's not what I paint. It is not, the reality. It's, it's not an isolated. What the Minister picture. of Finance so, said on Thursday. So, so, financing the budget is challenging for every country in the world today. Show me one exception. So, but in that context, you see that in places where we are built infrastructure, for example, land values have increased. That land doesn't belong to us. So, the asset value of the landowner where we have improved infrastructure has gone about 30 or 40 percent. He's richer by that much. In places where we are building, jobs have emerged. Those jobs were not there when we came. So if we're not building, they won't be there. I speak to these people at construction sites and they say, look, thank the president too, but for him, we wouldn't even have a job. Some of them make as much as 10,000, 15,000, 3,000, 5,000 daily. This and they are contracted for yeah, two, three they, years. These are the segments of, of a bigger picture. But the bigger yes. picture is not looking good. For example, uh, as much as you talk about this infrastructure, the question is what are the infrastructure without security? We will plan on this infrastructure without good security. These are some of the questions Nigerians so, are raising. So and if you want if, to talk about example, security, so let's go there and say that I think that my own view, my belief, is that we need to have a more rigorous intellectual conversation about national security. I've listened to quite a number of interventions on this program. I agree with some. I disagree vehemently with others. I think that we need to first look at security beyond guns, beyond uh, law enforcement agents. Law enforcement agents don't necessarily guarantee security. There are certain things that reside with us, a value system, for example, and that is built from the homes, and the management of conflict at communal level to resolve conflict so that they don't last beyond the night. Because inevitably, when you bring law enforcement, there has been a breach already, except of us, and I acknowledge the deterrent effect that law enforcement can provide. But the truth of the matter is how do we ensure that conflict is reduced to the barest minimum. Some of the security issues arise from land. They arise from drug abuse. They arise from a belief system. Minister, the question is how your government has been able to handle it, so, whether so, or not so, you have handled it better, so, so, and I'm whether saying, or not Nigeria has dipped in terms of insecurity over the years well, that depends, you have been in government. It depends on the security challenges, and I'm not here to, to, to faff over that. But I can tell you that when I came to Abuja in 2015, I know what the security challenges in Abuja were. Are you saying they are better now? Listen to me. Let me answer your question. So I know what the security challenges were. There was hardly a public building in Abuja that you could enter without waiting for about 30 minutes. You will pass through soldiers sitting behind uh, sandbags. All of that has disappeared. This economy didn't run after 7 p.m. All of that has disappeared. New challenges have come up, and they need to be addressed. In 2010, there was no celebration that could be held by the government of Nigeria at Eagle Square. Not one. It used to be held in the courtyard of the villa. All of that is now happening. So those were security challenges. They have been overcome. New ones have evolved as new ones will evolve for if time ever ends. So let's understand and contextualize things. And I'm telling you that let us have an intellectual conversation, a rigorous conversation. Crime has benefits. 
for those who perpetrate it. How do we either take out the criminals or take out the benefits or take out both? And you need some intellectual rigor around it instead of just saying, oh, remove the service chiefs. Well, I mean, those are the conversations we are having. Let's take a breather, uh, Honorable Minister, because uh, 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 there are a lot of issues which uh, I'm afraid I have all my papers filled here with. Don't worry, I'm here. I'm here for as long <laughs> as you want me. But we take a breather. To engage you on those issues. <laughs> and when we come back, there are a few issues that we need to touch on on the issues of infrastructure. What the Buhari government has done under Babatunde Fashola as a Minister of Water and Housing, in fact, we've not even touched on housing. But will we go to the APC and the 2023 elections. Sarah Bashala is still with us. Stay with us, everyone. We'll be right back. Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us right here on, on Sunday Politics and Channels Television. The Minister of Works and Housing, Mr. Babatunde Fashala, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, has been our guest tonight on the program. Thank you so much indeed for your time. Thank um, you for having me. <laughs> Let's, uh, I'll, I'll backtrack just for a moment uh, because there are concerns over the uh, the Lagos, uh, the Abeokuta, Songwater, Abeokuta Road. Governor Dakwa Abeodun has declared an emergency on the Songwater, Abeokuta Road. He says uh, his government will take over the road if the federal government is unable to fix it. How do you react to this? Okay, so I have been talking to Governor Abeodun for a bit and... Uh, I am not going to um, engage in needless administrative detail here, but I know that Governor Abiodun is aware, is a law-abiding citizen and a governor. He knows that that road is a federal road, and I don't know where his uh, powers to take over a federal road will come from. I think the powers to administer a federal highway by the Federal Highways Act rest with the minister. And I have provided every support that I can. That road is being funded by the Sukuk. There's a contractor working there, Julius Berger. Um, that road was inherited uh, by this administration. And from the Lagos end, work is going on. I am aware that at the Otashongo end, uh, work hasn't progressed significantly to his satisfaction. But we are limited by the resources that we have. Uh, Governor Abiodun has spoken to me before that he wanted to fund the road, and I said, show me where the money is coming from. Where do you have the money? The road is about 56 billion naira. How much was he able to show you? Well, I'm still waiting. I, I'm sure he has something he wants to show me. That's why he wants to take it over. If he can provide a source of funding, then we will go through the process of transferring a road from a federal government to a state government, because there's a law that specifies how that is done. So, um, and I'm sure that Governor Biodun has enough of his own state roads too to engage and occupy his attention. Let's go into and uh, get your clarification uh, about the Sukuk uh, bonds. Uh, please, can you clarify the, this concept of the Sukuk? We understand that it is not a loan. How do we repay? And how confident are you that tolls will be adequate to repay the facility? No, not all the Sukuk roads are going to be told. We announced a tolling policy for Nigeria uh, after a FEC approval, and we specified and described the kind of roads which will be dual carriageways that will be told. The dual carriageways represent only about, uh, I think, 20 or so percent of the national road network of about 200,000 kilometers. Essentially, unless it is totally unavoidable, single carriageways will not be told. The Sukuk is, uh, if, uh, is debt being taken by government, but it is not conventional debt. It is Islamic debt, where uh, interest is considered as usury and haram. And debt management office has contracted to uh, uh, take that debt so that we use it to finance infrastructure. And in that process, the Sukuk takes interest in the assets until the debt is liquidated. That is how basically uh, Islamic debt, Islamic financing works. And it is used globally. The difference between that what we are used to is the charging of interest, but it is debt. And uh, we are in a debt crisis at the moment. 
uh, debt servicing. The, the, the Minister of Finance came out and talked she, about the debt she, servicing. I think that you need to understand the clip that I saw about the Minister of Finance. She didn't say that we were in a debt crisis. She didn't say that. She was talking about the challenges of financing subsidy. And uh, if, if it was oh, the finance. same thing, just let's just let me finish. If it was the same thing that I saw recently uh, in the public uh, conversation where they were preventing, I think, medium term expenditure framework or something, the challenges of financing our budget with, with, uh, with uh, uh, um, maintenance of subsidies. So cities in Nigeria was in a debt crisis. She didn't say that. So don't import words that. I don't recall hearing, mm. unless you hear, and if you hear where she said debt crisis, play it. Let Nigerians listen to it. Minister, and I'd like to ask, I asked a question again, I mean, earlier on, whether or not Nigeria is broke. And I've the told you that to that the best of my knowledge, in... I've told you that to the best of my knowledge, Nigeria is not broke. Being indebted and being able to service your debt in conventional finance is not being broke. In any event, I think you must understand that the business of lending itself is a profitable business. So if nobody contracted debt, where would all the banks and the financial institutions be? Where would they throw all the people they employ? So this is a matter of credit rating and credit reputation. And it is this uh, home economics mentality that I can't take debt that led us to take $12 billion cash to go and pay off a debt we could have rescheduled renegotiated when our infrastructure was dying. That mentality must leave our table. All of the big nations we want to compete with are contracting debt to build their infrastructure and outperform competition. So, and as long as you can service your debt, you are good. So you think that Nigeria is okay with the, with the progression of our debt? Look, listen, she don't import words no, I'm asking that. I know what I that. say. I choose my words. No, no, no. And Minister, I'm saying that, look, okay, you, let me you reverse are, the you're question. You're taking the job I trust from Nigerians. Let me reverse the question. And they have the right to know whether or not what, oh. what this, the situations are. Oh, I can the conveniently tell here. you. I can conveniently tell you here that I'm not Nigeria's Minister of Finance. My job is to spend the money, not to earn it. That's my job. I, do you care whether or not the, the, the manner well, in which we are concerned. borrowing is too much for as a burden? I, I am concerned, and every responsible Nigerian should have his eye on the debt, and you should be concerned. But the conversation to have, so you are really now Lagos or Ta, you are really now Ekiti, Akure, Adu, Ekiti, and all of those. Where's the money going to come from? Should we increase taxes? Let's have the debate. Who should we tax more? Which road, which state will say don't do our road? If, we, if there's any state that says don't do our road, don't do our bridge, our debt obligation and our finance obligation is reduced, reduced by that reduction. That is the point. The government, so, and I'm the saying party to, promised that you are going to do this. You promised Nigerians that you have the capacity to we do it. We promise you change, and we are delivering them on infrastructure. You and can the, see them. The indices they are, are getting better. To when you got in they your are government, getting better. 2015, and now, Honorable Minister, uh, the price of commodities in the market, the, the debts are burning when you get into, you want to go into there. office. So let's no, go there. Let's go, go there. there. I mean, I have the statistics. I want to go there. So yeah, let's absolutely. go there. So the question is that the indices are totally different from what we have today. So my first question to you. I, and, am, I ask the question. Yes, I will answer you, and I will answer I'm you. I'm not obliged I will to answer, answer you answer, rhetorically. You don't have okay, to answer. Okay, go ahead, please. I will answer you rhetorically. Show me one country where the cost of living is going down. That is why nations have wage reviews. That is why they do salary reviews. This government has done it. It has not only done it; it has helped governments, state governments that are not able to pay, give out bailout funds. Which Nigerian government did that in our history when there was pain? We have refunded debt contracted by our predecessors for road infrastructure, their road infrastructure done. We've refunded almost a trillion, 700 and something billion. That's part of the debt you are talking about. It was contracted by the previous government. So, and let us go back. How much was the price of fuel in 20, 1999? It was 20 Naira. They left it at 65 Naira. That's a 300% increase, if my math is correct. So which country is the price going down? This is the reality of like, how much was the exchange rate? It was about $40. How much did they leave it at? Well, it's heading so, towards No, 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 it's not what now. it's heading to. No, 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 I mean. It the... is the reality of, of life that prices 
are headed in the wrong direction. And the whole world now is facing a challenge. And let us understand, let us educate people, right? If you are talking about interest rates, I, I, I mean, uh, FX, for example. FX is a quantum of what you earn. What are we exporting against what we are importing and what we are demanding? So if the country is not earning it, central bank doesn't print dollars. It's economics. When there is an over-demand for a commodity, basic economics tells you the price goes up. All right. Minister, so it's that simple. I like to take If you, we earn yeah. more dollars, mm. the exchange rate will come down. Unfortunately, I, I may not be able to push further in this direction because I want to take you into politics. <laughs> we are in the season of politics. Uh, but quickly, maybe in 30 seconds, if you may, mm. security and securing this nation is what this government has promised. Yeah. And right now, um, would it be a case of this government hiding its head in shame with the situation that we have on our hands. Look at what happened to those that are being kidnapped and the weeping that we've seen with these elements uh, doing in Kaduna, uh, northwest region of the country. You promise as a major agenda to secure this country. Would you say or would you agree that security is better today? I sympathize very, very deeply and sincerely with everybody who has been a victim of crime. I've also been a victim of crime in my previous life, and it's not a nice experience. And I hope that somehow this government comes through for them and brings them relief. But having said that, Shemu, um, security is not something that I will sit down and politicize. It is like oxygen. Now, the odds against government every time is that government has to be right all the time. The criminals have to be right only once. And that is why I said earlier that the security conversations require some very, very detailed rigor. If we are not looking at values, if we are not looking at how crime proceeds are dealt with, how we can intercept that to make it unprofitable, if people believe, for example, that you can kidnap a human being, and take body parts and you can make money from human head and all of those funny things. Look, listen, in this country, don't forget that sometimes it takes a long time for a problem to come to full bloom. But the seeds for some of what is happening, not all of them, the seeds, for, the seeds were sown many years ago. You remember that in 2001 or 2002, Nigerian policemen went on strike. Maybe you don't recall. They went on strike. The nation was without policemen for like a week or two. Go back into your archives, you see it. That was a warning. You will see that it is state governments that are resourcing and funding policemen. It didn't start yesterday. And that was also a problem. So all of the basic law enforcement civilian capacity has not been met by previous federal government. And I'm not saying that we have also met them, but, and they have all uh, accrued at a time now. But I maintain very, very seriously that until we deal with our value system, until we go back through the homes, the religious institutions, reshape values from preaching miracles, sudden wealth, because some of these things are driven by that. They're driven by drugs. They're driven by parents, us, me inclusive, not as involved in the development of, of our children. So it's going to take more than, say, federal governments. It's going to take a whole nation right. to come back and say, this is where we want to end. Right. And I think that conversation is going to be a very extensive one. All right. Um, let's get into politics within the next few minutes that we have left on the program. And let within me begin... 60 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> let me see, I have uh, some few minutes. What's your relationship with, uh, relationship with Ashiwa Jubala Tinobu? Our relationship is good. Does it consult you on political matters recently? We spoke about some matters, I think, about just before the Eid. How involved would you be in this, uh, his ambition of wanting to become president? As involved as possible. I've been involved all through. I've played my role, but I've played... I, well, you decide whether it's quiet. Because your quiet has because, been so loud. Because... <laughs> be, because your I've silence been, has been very loud. Oh, really? I've been MMB. <laughs> what does that mean? Minding my own business. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but okay. I've played my role. Yeah. I've played my role all through. 
And I don't need to be in the public space to make my interventions, to mm -hmm. offer advice, and to offer suggestions. But if at any point in time it becomes necessary for me to do so, I will do so. If you look at the conversations between Ashwa Jitinobu and Elijah Atiku Abubakar over the weekend, I mean, they're discussing issues that is at the center of their ambitions. And for those who are calculating already, and in fact, the deep calculations, which some of us will, will come out with some of the anal analysis in the coming days. Now, would you say that there is some kind of miscalculation in the choice of your former principal in respect of his choice of a running mate? So I'm going to say first and foremost that for both men for whom I have a personal relationship, uh, I think the perhaps the exchange of words, uh, at best I will call it a stumble. I hope it's not a tumble. And I mean this in the sense that they should quickly recalibrate and get back to the issues. And that is what concerns Nigerians. That's, those are the debates we should really have. How do we move ourselves to the prosperity that is imminent that this country will have? Because I know it will happen. Who is the best person to drive that vehicle? In my own opinion, I assure you is the best person to drive that vehicle because I've worked with him at very close quarters. I know his capacity. Uh, I know his tenacity. And uh, I think that uh, sometimes we need to test some hypotheses. And the opportunity to test this hypothesis is there. My position about religion has been made known on different platforms. I think religion should leave the public space and go back to where it belongs, to the homes and the religious centers. There's too much religion in our public life. And there are no nations that I know that we want to be like that is valorizing religion. It's a private thing, praying in public and others. I think we should just stop them and get down to the real business. When you are in the office, go and do your work. But when it affects, when it's a factor in our politics, I mean, as such that it's also a fa also factor in the bigger economies. I mean, bigger country. I mean, uh, I don't say bigger countries. When it's a factor in uh, more advanced economies. You see, you're struggling uh, with it. You see, you're struggling with No, no, I'm not struggling. That. I'm just so trying try to get the right part, words. You see, I'm saying part? that these are some factors also in <laughs> democracies that we try to uh, picture. You see, as you, see you also have to understand that democracy is, a, is an undertaking of numbers, essentially. Democracy is not necessarily always rational. Um, it's the tyranny of the majority that has replaced the tyranny of the minority because democracy was created to stop one man or one woman from dictating to the majority. So it was the tyranny of the minority that democracy came to replace. Democracy sometimes has become a tyranny of the majority and is, a, is an undertaking, I call it a, an undertaking of multiplication and, ad, and addition not of subtraction and division. So everybody will make his political calculation about what he thinks will best serve his purpose. And, think I think, that decision... and I think to look at something simply on the basis of A or B is perhaps to miss the point. I have some polls that I did in 2014 that I would have loved to share with you. And I think sometimes we should stop being afraid of fear itself. You know, if this is something that is real, the votes will show it eventually. And that's my take, really. But in terms of, look, at the end of the day, who cares? Who cares, really? We both drank water here. We didn't ask who made the water during the interlude. So that's the issue. People want to drink water. People want good schools. People want good health care. People want infrastructure. They want to be secure. So if you go on both sides, you know, there's been a... Christian vice president under a Muslim president. Sadly, people were killed in the church. Sadly, priests have been murdered. The same way Muslims have been murdered. Neither the president or the vice president loves those things to happen. I don't, you don't. But it has very little to do with our faith. Those who do it in the name of our faith are not members of our faith. They don't profess our faith. Mm. Both faiths preach peace. And you don't see that there's something... They, they preach, that they they preach something tolerance. To, Those people are extremists. Why does it look like it's your own... It's, I mean, it's not, it doesn't look... It is your, only your party 
has done the same faith choice in this race. No, 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 no. So let's let's not let's not. That's a re- fact. Let's not in this race. Yes. Okay, in this, in this race, race. Yes. Okay, yes. this race. Yes. It's only uh, a party that yes. has done the same faith uh, cho- uh, pick. Yes, in for this, the presidential in this ticket. Race, yes, yes. So what's the what's the what's the uh, what, what, what are people afraid of? You know, I asked one question. We even assume that there are only two faiths. So if this is about representation, we haven't represented everybody. There are some people, minorities there, who don't belong to both faiths. They have a voice too. So let's find a, a second vice president for them or a president for them. You think he doesn't have any, he's going, not, not going to challenge the, the, the ticket? No, 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 no. I'm just saying that let us, let us, de, let us de, demystify this thing about what it really is. And that's why my starting position was leave religion where it belongs. Right. In the hearts of people, in the churches and mosques and places of worship, and in the homes. And in the public space, no. Religion doesn't belong there. Mr. Fashola, uh, we need to close down, and we will try to do that in 30 seconds. What is your mind telling you about 2023? Is it a time that perhaps some Nigerians may not think that your party can take them further? And what happened in 2015 when an incumbent was beaten could happen? Do you see that happening? I think that on the basis of what we have done, uh, Nigerians have had the opportunity of two governments. So, and I think that's why I said the candidates should return to the issues on very deep reflection, right-thinking and well-meaning Nigerians will re-elect our party into government. I'm, I'm optimistic about that. I think we have served this country uh, as efficiently as we can in the most difficult of times. No government has faced COVID. We did. And, you know, so uh, no government has faced a global scarcity of resources caused by a war in which we are not involved. We did. And we are still managing that economy and providing hope and sustenance. Right. I'm optimistic that we will win. Mr. Babatunde Raji Fashala, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Minister of Works and Housing, thank you so much indeed for coming tonight. Thank you for, for some me. reasons we couldn't even go to housing. <laughs> well, for some other time, I, I guess we, we will be able to get you out of minding your business into public business. No, as <laughs> long as I'm a public servant, I'll mind my business, but I'll come and talk to you about housing and other things. Thank you so much, Mr. Fashala, for coming tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, that's our show for tonight, everyone. Many thanks for watching. I'm Sean Okimale. Bye for now.